it's a great privilege to now introduce the next panel. This is, is a panel that's now happened year on year for the last five years, uh, reflecting the trends in our industry around data, digital, and technology. It's an incredible uh, group of panelists that I'll let our wonderful moderator, Najat Khan, introduce. Just briefly, Najat Khan is a, is a, a figurehead and a leader in, in the field. She's the Chief Data and Science Officer at Janssen, and she also leads the strategy and operations group. And one of the things that I've noticed about Najat as I've been on the circuit with her in various places is how, how, how much energy she brings and how patient focused she is. So Najat, with that said, I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Thank you, Karun, for having us all here. Um, you know, as Angie was saying, um, we've had this panel for a few years now, and it's really a testament to the fact that we are moving from you know, ideas and concepts of what we can do with data science to real impact that's happening. Now, the advent of generative AI has certainly helped uh, propel a lot of what's been happening you know, as dinner table conversations, which is fantastic, but we're gonna focus on healthcare today. And my oh, esteemed panelists here have actually looked at it from many different angles, from industry to academia, and then also from all the way from discovery, the inception of understanding what's driving a disease, which we frankly have a lot more to do and work on. Uh, the work is definitely not done to clinical trial execution and then ensuring that there's access to these really important medicines. And why is that important? Because we serve our patients and every single day there are patients that are waiting. And if we can improve the probability of success that something becomes a medicine and make it better faster, I think we have all served our core purpose. With that, um, what I will do is just set the context of, you know, um, my, my philosophy would be, you know, a lot of the times people have asked, is it hyper hope? And it's neither, it's just real. And to be competitive, and um, this is what we need to do. The question is, how do we do it really well? How do we collaborate even better to ensure that we have impact at scale? So with that, I'm gonna start with my first question. And it's for each of the panelists here. Couple of minutes answer. First, um, please share sort of an example where you have solved a significant problem or are solving a significant problem that would help make um, a, you know, a, a medicine, a transformational medicine for patients. So it can be a discovery, development, you pick. And then another example that we're not working on yet today because it's not prime time, but you anticipate will be prime time in the next few years. I'm gonna start with Alice. Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm Alice, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Virt Genomics. Um, we're using AI to develop new drugs for these kind of huge unmet needs like ALS, Parkinson's disease. And in my view, one of the reasons I started the company was because I think one of the biggest limitations right now, um, especially in applications of AI, is really the input data, right? We've seen huge advances in AI over the last you know, five, 10 years. But the fact of the matter is that the cost of R&D still continues to increase. And so what's the gap here? And I think what I see is that it's re really, um, you know, doable to generate large quantities of data from, you know, cell models. But ultimately, cell models aren't predictive of uh, success in humans. And so I believe that in biology, the biggest problem is really a missing data problem. So what we've been doing is instead of starting with cell models, we actually go directly to humans. We have a massive collection of human brains, human tissue from patients that have directly passed away from disease. And this has allowed us to quickly identify new mechanisms in ALS and also a new target in ALS that we discovered entirely from the platform and developed to clinical trials in just four years. So that's actually a new treatment for ALS that's currently in clinical trials. It's in a phase one trial um, based entirely on human data and based using our AI algorithms. And I think that's just such a promising example of how we can address this fundamental challenge of using AI, not just to test more drugs faster, but really mm -hmm. to fundamentally think about how can we increase clinical success? Because even an incremental change there would have massive um, implications on drug development writ large. And I think our fundamental belief is really the sophistication of your algorithms and AI 
on its own is insufficient if you don't have uh, the right data to, to train and learn from. So that's kind of our hope at Verge is that by really building the right data sets that are truly predictive, we can get to better outcomes, not just faster and not just more, but higher quality outcomes. That's such a great point, Alice. I mean, it starts with understanding what's driving the disease. So your point around novel insights is going to change the way is it's so, so important. Um, all right, great. We'll go to Anne next. Thank you, Najat. And I'm Anne Hetherington. I'm head of the Data Sciences Institute and within R&D at Takeda. And it's an honor to be here with my fellow panelists. So I guess the example I'd like to give is Going, going back to patient centricity, which is there are many diseases where it's actually really hard to really understand the disease and monitor the disease in the patient. If you think about the brain and the intestine, it's, like, it's quite hard to get inside. And I know a couple of people in this panel are actually helping us in this space as well. And so within Takeda, we're developing uh, digital biomarkers and tools to help us get inside these organs. So for instance, for celiac disease, we are using an old technology, a pill cam, but what we've done is um, we use that to photograph and create video of thousands of thousands of frames along the length of the intestine, and then use AI algorithms to read those frames, understand the extent of the uh, impact of celiac disease along the whole length of the intestine. And therefore we can uh, monitor the impact of any subsequent treatment on those patients and really help us uh, really connect the pathology of the intestine to the uh, celiac symptoms that patients generally have to talk about. The other organ we're getting inside is the brain and uh, particularly in sleep disorders where we're using um, novel AI ML techniques to monitor EEG outputs to really help look at sleep staging and diagnosis of narcolepsy and thinking about wakefulness, quality of wakefulness during the day and then sleep staging at night. And uh, we have a group of data scientists and statisticians that are developing multiple dif different algorithms here to allow us to understand how uh, disorders like narcolepsy really impact patients. And so um, a bit like Alice described changes in how we get at medicines we want to really understand our patients and really develop drugs that impact their disease um, through a deep understanding of their disease. Thank you, Anne. It, I love how you actually connected the pieces around understanding what's driving the disease, but how do we measure it to determine are the outcomes getting better or even stratifying patients, bringing precision medicine um, to reality for all diseases, right? Um, so now I'm gonna to go to Dina, because I know Dina does some great cutting edge work in terms of not just digital endpoints, but how to bring you know, medicine and the patient centricity um, with devices and solutions that are um, much, much easier for patients and allow decentralized trials. So Dina, over to you. Yeah, thanks Nisha. So Dina Kitabi, a uh, professor at MIT and also the president and CEO of ML Innovations. Uh, so, Najat in the morning, actually, I asked Joaquin about uh, basically why clinical trials still, like 90% of the drugs, don't make it. And uh, I think that is very, very important question that we should ask. And this is where I think AI and data science, digital technology can help a lot. So I, I really very much like what uh, both Anne and Alice were saying, uh, particularly Alice mentioned something about going to the human, understanding diseases and target in the humans. And then you take this uh, these new drugs to the clinical trial. And now what we need is particularly in diseases that are complex, like in neurology, like ALS, like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, we need to be able to decide very quickly that we are on the right path or not, that we are seeing and creating through digital biomarker, I think here play a very, very important role. Can we get very early on, very quickly, insights whether these drugs are uh, able to provide sig statistical significance between the arm of the drug and the alternative arms? And this is actually where uh, we have proven 
uh, recently to uh, a publication in Nature uh, Medicine and Science Translational Medicine. Uh, the example that we use is Parkinson, but I think what we did extends beyond Parkinson's to other diseases like Alzheimer's, ALS, and others. But basically that we can use uh, our data uh, to very quickly with an, uh, reduce the sample size by an order of magnitude, you reduce the time of the trial and quickly be able to give statistical significance on uh, differentiating the different arm of, uh, in, in Parkinson's clinical trials. So uh, I think we need to move to, to the human as soon as possible. And this is what we are seeing in uh, increasingly. And we need to be able to provide statistical significance on optimizing the portfolio, even before thinking about like, okay, taking it to the FDA because today only 10% goes to the FDA. Yeah. And that's such an important point because if you can make that go, no go decision with the right methodology earlier on, you really change the trajectory in terms yeah. of the probability of success. So Dina, exactly. that's and a small sample size. Exactly. Smaller, more smarter, efficient trials. All right. Next, I'm going to go to Janai. You know, uh, Janai, tell us, I mean, you've been hearing the various examples, but would love to hear your perspective from, from the Microsoft tech side and also being a physician yourself, uh, a little bit about the examples that you're seeing that, that are making an impact. Thanks, Najat. Um, always difficult to follow such clever people who've come up with all the right answers before you. So I'm Janet Bajo. I'm a physician by training and background and, and the chief medical scientist at Microsoft Research. Um, so as I thought about your, your question, Najat, I think it's interesting how we think about the both the hope and the hype and how do we make it real. There's been so many potential options for what we could do. So many papers that have been written, but I think it still requires us collectively to take responsibility to how we think about real world impact as a consequence of some of these tools, technologies. Um, and there's huge opportunity across the entire pharma value chain, right? From discovery to development, all the way to commercialization and what we need to exist in the real world. Um, from a data perspective, I think we recognize the unlocked potential that we have across all types of data. So what we have in electronic medical records, what we have in social determinants of health, our genomic profiles, our individual behaviors and others, which is beginning to allow us to unlock novel digital biomarkers in addition to the biological markers that we already consider and have access to today. And the things that excite me on the discovery side is when you look at uh, ecosystem players and others who are doing some really novel work in optimizing small molecule drug candidates today and, and bringing that actually into the fore. So you look at the work that uh, Generate Biomedicines are doing, or you look at the work that Excientia are doing, and you think what needs to be true and how do we accelerate some of that work and bring that to life. And they work through a partnership mechanism with other partners, of course, as well. And the work that we're doing at Microsoft is truly to think about what do we do and what must we do to empower uh, the chemists and organizations, the trialists and organizations, uh, and colleagues across the pharma value chain to unlock the potential that they have with their data to ultimately deliver value to the end beneficiaries, the patients, public, and society for who need faster, cheaper, more specific medicines in the future. Great, Janayat. I mean, end to end, how do you enable to do this better? Now, moving on to Shastri. Shastri, tell us a little bit about your perspective. You know, the end to end platform, the ability to do all of these great examples that Dina and Alice and Janayat mentioned at scale in a reliable, transparent, and understandable way is super important. So, we'd love to hear your perspectives on that. Yeah, absolutely. If I can also answer the question about where we've seen the successes and where we see the opportunities. If we, we've been talking about data and digital and analytics for more than a decade in life sciences in a pretty serious way. And I think the biggest areas that we've now recorded successes across the industry are in the use of real world data for regulatory approvals, as well as in decentralized clinical trials. And then in the area of clinical operations around identifying new sites and investigators to be able to put the sites in. And then the biggest opportunity is something that we've talked about in this panel, as well as the previous panels, is this concept that I call around digital biology, which is how do you collect all of this high resolution multimodal data around the patient to be able to drive new insights, be it around disease progression and subcharacterization of disease, or simply identifying drugs that won't work in the patient so that you have a better chance of success around putting the patient on the right drug. Now to your question, Najat, about platforms and the platform story. 
we are still on that path a decade in around building these big, robust, scalable platforms that are reliable. And the analogy I draw is around electricity. When electricity first came in as a utility, it took about 20 years for electricity to be truly integrated into the operations of the industry. And because everything had to change, the way the plants were laid out, the way the workers were trained around the use of electricity, as well as drawing this boundary between do you have a power plant in-house or do you actually go buy the utility from someone outside? And I think we're under a similar journey around AI about how do we start to build these platforms at scale and how do we partner? Uh, what standards should we be adopting as well as how do we ensure that we have robust and reliable data that we're able to use for training our algorithms because that's really what drives the downstream use. And, and, and it's also iterative. All of us as an industry are trying to build the plane while we're flying it. So, so it's not like the platform is built and then we do a big bang launch and then everyone starts to use it. We're driving this continuous innovation where we continue to tweak what the platforms look like. And then people in the big pharma organizations as well as biotechs are guiding us around here are the use cases to prioritize and here is what we want to do in-house versus what we want to do outside. So I think we're in the second decade of our journey around the broad-based adoption of these technologies and the drug development process. I believe the processes will fundamentally change at the end of this decade. And it's going to be a lot of co-creation and partnership as we continue to go along this journey of building these platforms at scale. Super helpful, Shastri. And, and you know, just reflecting before going to the next question on the answers here, I mean, you all have shared examples starting from Target ID to Genai Dimension, sort of the de novo design that's happening, small molecule and biologics, to digital endpoints, for stratification, monitoring outcomes, Shastri to the clinical trials piece in RWE in terms of evidence generation. So there's really value across the board. Platforms not, are not built perfectly yet, but we are getting there and it's totally gonna take collaboration. No one person is gonna be able to do it on their own. I guess the question for me is, you know, when you think about unlocking that value end to end, there are still some, with any new innovation or any new approach, challenges that exist, whether it's the data quality, the data integration, whether it's the deployment of some of these new approaches, because the ecosystem has to also mature while you're trying to do it. You have to do it all at the same time. And then there's the good old cultural change. So I'd love to uh, just get perspectives from a couple of you of what do you think will it take um, to really unlock this value? Because if not, we're not doing the right thing for our patients. So I'll start with Anne first, just your perspective from what you've, you know, you're seeing at Takeda, but many industries before that, many pharma companies before that. And then I'll also go uh, to Dina from the academic perspective and being on the scientific advisory boards and just being a rounded, awesome person in the space that's innovating and pioneering your perspective as well. What is it going to take? So starting with Anne first. So I think, um, it can take many things. And I actually considered which answer I give for this. I, like many people here, I could give multiple answers. But I think the answer I'm going to give is within, within a company, and I'll speak, I could talk externally, but for this answer, I'll talk internally. Within a company, we need to really take our responsibility for data very, very seriously. And we need to take control of our data in terms of its governance, its quality, its storage, its accessibility. And so within Takeda, we have done two things actually that are really leaning into that notion. The first one is, is that we've brought our technology and data partners into the business of R&D. And we have brought um, the disciplines that really think about how we use data in clinical trials, like our statisticians, our clinical pharmacologists, to sit beside our, um, our technologists, our data scientists, our data architects, our data engineers. And so by, by bringing the technologists and the business experts together, we're really galvanizing everybody to really think about the business of R&D and how do we develop drugs um, with a greater insights to data to get them to patients faster. So that's one big area that we have done. The second big change we've made is that we're halfway through a build phase for our clinical trials where we are really taking control of our clinical trial data. And we're really mm -hmm. taking a quality first automation first uh, mindset for this. So we're thinking about how do we ingest our data no matter where it comes from? You know, it could be digital tools, as I mentioned before. It could be uh, e-pros, it could be uh, those captured at sites. 
how do we ingest that data? How do we derive its quality? How do we make sure by the end of the trial that we are ready just to push a button at our database lock because our data is high quality? And by doing this in a very repeated way, we're just where our goal is to have high quality efficiency in our system. And then through good governance, enable appropriate access to that data for both primary and secondary use. So there are two things that we're doing internally to really move us along this path within R&D. Excellent. And Dina? Yeah, so um, I would say, okay, so there are many challenges, of course, but I want to pick one challenge because I think it's probably the most fundamental challenge. It's the culture, I think. And you said that I'm in academia and not just in academia, I'm a computer scientist also. So take it from someone who's outside your industry and looking at it. But for the last six years, I've been interacting. I mean, I'm on the staff of uh, Janssen uh, and work with many of you guys. I'm looking at it from the outside, from a computer scientist perspective, and I really love the industry. I can see, like I work with the scientists, I work with the R&D people, prices aside, and that's a different question, but the the the, the industry has a level, the scientists, the chemists, the, the, the biologists, the people who develop drugs have immense, immense ability to innovate on the drug design, on the chemistry, on the biology, but they are really conservative when it comes to digital, when it comes to the thing that they don't really know and therefore they don't trust. And as a result, like naturally, and like everything that we, we are not so comfortable with because we don't understand it that well, there is a huge gap there that they are way more willing to, to accept things like uh, genetic drugs or uh, gene therapy, cell therapy, stuff like that, because it's closer to their understanding. When it comes to digital AI, it's this black box and there is the cultural uh, gap, I think, is one of the biggest challenges. And pharma is by nature a conservative industry, particularly when it comes, I think, to health, to, to digital is even bigger uh, conservatism that you can see in the history, like even the, the electronic PROs, we still don't see them everywhere. It's just like sometimes we have clinical trials with paperwork and you ask why, like why we are still in 2023 have that. So so I think that there is a need to uh, understand and uh, accept a bit that you have to take some challenges. Of course, you, you have to be very, very careful when it comes to patients and people's lives, but you have to be more open to, to digital and AI and digital health and look at it and, and work with those, with those concepts and adopt them in your operation much more. Yeah, I mean, both of your answers, super insightful. And I mean, if you don't have the data platforms, hard to do at scale. And Dina, the cultural aspect, it's its a really good insight because in, on, on one hand, I would just say that, you know, pharma companies, it's a highly risky business, right? 10% success rate. I mean, these are risk takers, right? I mean, I would say, but it's a new discipline. Well, and very innovative. Taking. Like, it's amazing. I really like working with pharma because actually the level of innovation and the mentality, I'm, I work with scientists in, in the pharma industry. Yeah. So, I mean, I, but I was going to say that, you know, I, I do think representing pharma today, like it is a very high risk, is high tolerance for risk and innovation, but it's a new discipline that's merging and coming together. And I, and I, the sooner it can be adopted, I couldn't agree with you more. I think the better off we will all be, you know, um, Alice, I would love your perspectives on this too, you know, just, just from a company from a biotech tech bio, I don't know what's the perfect term these days, but really looking at how you figure out the right targets, drivers of disease in a different way. And also the culture and mindset must be different. So how are you pulling that together, both the science um, medicine and the data science aspect? Yeah, thanks. I think it's a really interesting time. And, you know, on the topic of tech versus biotech, startup versus pharma, I think that you know, we're entering this new era. I'm a believer we're entering a new tech-driven era where just increasingly technology is advancing at just an unprecedented rate. The cycles are getting compressed. 
And when this happens, you have to really think about what is the right culture to leverage all of these advantages. I like, I read a quote once from the founder of Genentech that said, um, you know, I always maintained the best attribute we had was naivete. Um, and I think in times when the playbook has yet to be written and where the technological challenges can be daunting, oftentimes innovation may be even more ex important than experience, right? And naivete can actually be an asset. So I think we're starting to see actually this new breed of CEOs that don't look like what other CEOs have looked like in the past, um, where, you know, being very nimble and very quick about how you make decisions, you know, in the field that we work in AI and genomics, you know, if it takes you months to make a decision, the landscape looks entirely different. We've seen that with, you know, chat GPT and generative AI in months. And I think it's important to think about how are we evolving our culture at Verge, we have had a very different culture than I would say the vast majority of pharma companies and biotechs. We have a huge emphasis, for example, on emotional vulnerability, where we actually we start meetings by naming our emotions. We meditate for 10 minutes every day. And I think that this reflects a larger shift in the generations now that are entering the workforce, because I think that there's a shift from a leadership style of pounding your fists on the table, saying we're crushing it every day, to one where people really want to see authenticity. They want to be brought along. They don't want the leader that has it all figured out. And I think that, you know, our workforce being very heavy on engineering and AI is uh, tends to be a younger kind of population. And that's, you know, been really key for us to really attract and retain these folks, especially when we live in a neighborhood when Google and Facebook are, you know, constantly approaching our employees and offering them packages of four times what they're making now. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, it's a, couldn't agree more. It's a new, new breed of talent that, you know, I've used the word bilingual before, but understand both disciplines. I think it's a balance, you know, but, um, I'm biased, but, you know, we have to get on board and, and really figure out how to do it effectively. Thank you for sharing, Alex. You know, one thing is, um, you know, we hear about the data, the platform, the cultural change, um, the change in the type of leadership, as you mentioned, Alice, right? Like all of that is changing, but it's in the midst of that, I think one thing that concerns people quite a bit is around, you know, how are we using AI for good? You know, how are we using a data science in a responsible way, in an ethical way, in a transparent way? Because for centuries, any, any new innovation can do a lot of good and and the reverse can also happen. So the guardrails are really important and um, the understanding of it and how you apply it is important. So with that, I'd love to uh, pose the question, starting with Junai at first, just you know, tell us a little bit about what does responsible AI mean to you? And then you know, what are the aspects to really think about around the data, the algorithms, development, deployment, and so forth? Uh, thank you for thank you for the opportunity. So the exam question that I focus on at Microsoft is how might we transform the practice of medicine with trusted, reliable, human-centered AI? So it's not just about AI, but it's all the precursor words I said that are really, really important around the trusted nature of, of what we do, the reliability of things. It has to work. Um, but within that, there's an ethical, equitable, and responsible component to it. And so there's a, a conversation and an ethos that many communities in the AI space have been thinking about for a long time. We have a set of principles and standards within Microsoft that we call the responsible AI principles that we try and adhere to when we think about both the development of tools and products, in addition to then the deployment of these tools and products. And so we think about the importance of uh, fairness, of reliability and safety, of privacy and security, of inclusiveness, of transparency and of accountability. And there are checks and balances and a governance process that we have to go through in throughout the course of the research development cycle through to product development cycle and then to the deployment cycle. And then what's probably required on the receiving end, if we've built what we have, how does that look within some of our partner organizations? How equipped do they feel around the checks and balances that we have put in to the checks and balances that they'll probably have to put in on their side. And I think it's an uneven playing field at the moment where the tech companies have their principles and approach, but actually I'm not sure how many pharma companies have a set of responsible AI governance processes in their organizations today that they're willing to adhere, adopt, or combine with. And then you extend it out and then the pharma companies are probably thinking, so what are the regulators thinking about this space and how do they feel about responsible AI. And if we were to 
submit something to a regulator of your choice, even if we've adopted these, is this good enough? And I, I sometimes mm-hmm. wonder whether everybody's waiting for somebody else to do something first. Somebody's w- willing to go to the FDA first or the MHRA first or EMEA first and waiting for them to give permission on the approach. But everybody's mm-hmm. learning this at pace and scale. So we've spoken about generative AI. I'm sure if we had this conversation last year, we wouldn't even mention generative AI in this uh, dialogue today. But now it's in the hands of everybody. 100 million people adopting it within six weeks. It's democratized access to these tools, techniques, and solutions. And it will be affecting all aspects of our life as a general purpose technology. What do we need to do to ensure the safe deployment of these from healthcare and life science purposes within the organizations that you represent and how we do it from a technology side and work hand in hand to do it in a safe, reliable, and effective manner, I think is the the challenge before us collectively. The challenge and a huge opportunity. So um, I'm just gonna ask one question, lightning round. I'm gonna start with Shastri, 30 seconds. Who's gonna be, you know, we have folks from the tech background or, or tech companies focusing on the space, pharma, big and small. Um, and we also of course have tech bio, the new age or biotech, tech bio companies. Who are gonna be the winners in the next five years? Who's actually gonna make a significant dent in what we consider as valuable impact using data science and making medicines? Shastri first, but 30 seconds. Yeah, all of them. The space is just so big. I don't think there's gonna be any single winner that takes all. We're gonna see tremendous progress across all of these players. And hopefully as a community, A, we learn from each other to be able to move the ball forward a lot faster and share best practices. And then secondly, to build on what Junaid said, I really hope that as an industry, we come out with good AI practices. Just as we have good manufacturing practices, good clinical practices, we need to come out with good AI practices that allow us to be able to promote and use ethical use of AI. Because the training data sets actually amplify the disparities in healthcare and the lack of diversity in clinical trials, and we just can't keep amplifying the problem. We need to figure out how we break it. Love it. And? So in my mind, if the winner isn't the patient, we can all pack up our bags and go home. <laughs> um, seriously. That's the best. So either we directly get good drugs to patients faster by speeding along the, the development and discovery cycle, or we indirectly make it easier to take away the operational components and things. But no matter what way we slice it, if the patient's not winning, we're not doing our job. Alice? I totally agree, but I also love saying uh, being controversial on panels because I think it makes it more interesting. I will say that for any fast moving technology, obviously from a bias perspective, that ultimately I think that smaller companies are more well equipped to just move more quickly and capitalize initially on those technologies. You know, I, you know, many pharma companies are so talented, but I think just structurally, there are a lot of challenges that misalign incentives, both on the financial side, the bottom line, and what's really needed to really see a highly risky technology and innovation through. So I think if it follows history, I think my prediction is that the biggest initial advances will be made on the startup side when there's clear kind of de-risking, then pharma companies will come in and collaborate more broadly. But I think a lot of the initial innovation will be made from startups as a startup founder myself. Great. Dina? So I don't think that there is a sector that's going to be a winner or loser. I think actually all of them will have winners and we have will have losers. And what I think is going to be very important is the role of, of leaders, because there are going to be many big decisions that are, are, have high stakes. And uh, people are going to make different decisions and companies that are going to make the right decisions are going to be the winners and companies who are going to be like taken by the inertia, they are just, uh, they might find themselves irrelevant. And Junaid, before we go to Q&A, bring us home. I should have gone before Dina. I think, I think it is leadership, but it's leadership with a long-term view. So not mm-hmm. just about short-termism. I think it's sustained leadership And leadership that is not just willing to make the investment, but go on the change curve and change and transform business processes within their organizations to enable and unlock the value of these technologies moving forward. I couldn't agree more. I think the leadership aspect and leaning in day in and day out when it gets hard, 
um, and actually ensuring we keep the talented folks inside and outside, they're empowered, so they can actually have an equal share of voice and make a difference. I think that's that's going to be what helps us all. Thank you to everyone. Now, uh, we have a few minutes left. Um, we have a couple of Q&A questions. I'll start with Chris Benko. Um, Chris, take it away. Nice to see you, nice to see you all. Thanks, Najat. Um, we have really great representation on this panel, as, as we often do. We've got some really well-capitalized technology companies, pharma companies, and other early-stage companies represented. Um, right now, the capital markets are really tough. And, and I know that we're seeing a lot of earlier stage companies with technology capabilities not have the capital required for their, their companies to be going concerns or to generate all the clinical evidence they might need. And my observation in this field in the last 10 years is that very often people have two out of the three capabilities, but you need them all. You might have technology and capital, but you don't have the clinical development capability, or you might have the clinical capabilities like pharma, you don't understand the technology. So my question back to you all is, are resources really allocated in the right place right now across the industry? Or if you had the opportunity to squeeze the balloon, if you will, and shift some resources from one place to the other, where might you do that in order to make sure that promising innovations actually make their way all the way through to patients and their use at scale? Uh, I can I can start with, uh, again, look, I want to like put in controversial views out there. So I would say one area where I think resources are not as democratized as they could be really is in venture capital right now. I think a lot of the classic formation of biotech companies is uh, concentrated within very few VCs. They go out to academic groups, they decide what is um, promising, and then they start these companies from within the VCs, oftentimes perverse incentives um, to flip them and take them public. Right. And I think that's what's led to a lot of the challenges in the bubble that we see right now. I think that the field is changing. I think we're moving more and more towards like a tech like model where there's more organic company formation that are coming directly from the scientists, the postdocs, the grad schools, out of grad school that are started because there's someone that's passionate about the problem and the idea. And I think that overall democratization of company formation dollars into the hands of many rather than the hands of few. Um, will lead to better uh, innovation because that will lead to, um, you know, supply demand. Like what are the ideas that are actually needed by the field rather than just um, what um, people think can be profitable in the next five years? If I can yeah. jump in, Chris, uh, to answer your question. Uh, I think just given the resource crunch, there is going to be a greater need for what I'd call translational tech organizations, which is how do you work backward from the patient and take all of this amazing innovation that's happening in biology and technology and turn that into treatments that get to patients faster. I think we have a lot of innovation that's happening in pockets. Nobody's really taking a step back and saying, how do you string all of this together to be able to fundamentally change the patient outcomes? Sorry, Anne, uh, you were saying something. Yeah, no, actually a similar but different answer actually. I think, I think tech companies are really good at the ideas and pitching the ideas and starting there. The piece that's missing for me is the scalability uh, for clinical trials and for testing. So that piece, if the tech companies were able to have more resources and more understanding of that scalability piece, that's so important uh, for us in pharma and the rigor piece, so scalability and rigor, I think that if we could bolster that in the tech side, I think that would be really helpful. Thank you, Anne. All right, I'm gonna go. Thank you, Chris, for the question. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, Deepa, um, are you on? Deepa, can you hear us? All right, um, thankfully, I know Deepa's question, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try my best to ask the question. Um, so one of the things uh, that Deepa had mentioned is uh, we talk a lot about the various different data sets, uh, and I think Shastri, you and others mentioned a little bit around EHR, clinical omics data, and so forth. Connectivity of the various data sets is really important to be able to do this better at scale. And of course, there's a lot of questions around using it in a way that doesn't, you know, add to any bias. So just a couple of answers from the panelists here in terms of how do you see that evolution happening from a multimodal data perspective to answer some of these really, really important questions. 
I'll throw out two controversial perspectives. The first one is the reason we've hidden behind large data sets of large N numbers is because we want to make up for errors in data. If we had really well curated data for small subpopulations, I think we should be able to get to really good insights a lot faster. So I would like to see a shift away from this from this uh, big rush we have to get the largest number of data sets to actually get these really clean, uh, meticulously curated data sets that are multimodal as well as high resolution that allow us to get to insights faster. And then secondly, I think back to my concept of, of good AI practices, how do you actually make sure that these training data sets are truly representative of the world so that these algorithms that come out are explainable and actually come out with something that we can rely on is gonna be a big thing that we have to solve for. And you know, there's a part of it that came up and maybe I'll um, just ask Adina and Alice to comment around prospective data too, right? In terms of generating data that's actually really comprehensive, doesn't have the missingness and is curated the way you need for the question you need to answer. Because a lot of real world data doesn't have that today and then having really good methods to solve for it. So maybe Dina, do you want to comment on that? And then Alice too? Sure. Yeah, so I, I do agree. And actually, I, I work with AI model. That's my bread and butter. And I do agree that actually it's very important to like a smaller data set that is the right data set is much better and uh, achieving the goal than a bigger data set that is noisy and has missing and wrong information. Uh, I particularly think that one of the data that we are missing, much of the data that we have is snapshots, like medical record or genetic data. And one of the things that I think is really important is to be able to have dynamic data that's tracking disease and symptoms and response to medications. Uh, yeah, agreed. I think um, I think a big learning we've had at Verge is that single data types on their own are not particularly helpful, but really looking at where signal converges across multiple data types um, is where you get the smoking gun of disease pathogenesis. Large scale genetic data sets being a great example of this, you know, got one in thinking we would find lots of new therapeutic targets. Instead, we found hundreds of variants. Um, each with a small risk of disease. And now the missing question is how do these different genetic hits actually tie together. Um, I think the nice thing about prospective data is that it gives you an opportunity to iterate using the models that you've um, developed. So there's always gonna be learnings on where the gaps are in the data. And if you don't have an ability to actually address those gaps quickly, right? Then that can be a big disadvantage versus prospective. Let's say you, we discover that you know a certain disease stage or longitudinal data is really important that allows you to alter how you're collecting the data to fill the gap quickly. So with that, great answers from everyone. Um, just want to say a big thank you to all the panelists. Um, you know, if I reflect back on each year we've had this panel and we go back even two, three years ago, there's been such a progression to see from impact use cases and just a level of sophistication around what works versus not and the collaboration that's increasingly happening to figure it out. So um, much more to do again for the patients that we all serve. Thank you so much um, everyone for your time and perspectives today. Um, back to Andy and Karun. Uh, could we have the poll slide please? Data science panel, really terrific and really appreciated the focus on culture uh, as much as the focus on technical. So for audience participation, the question that follows this panel is the following. Where are digital technologies likely to make their greatest impact on drug development in the near term? A, digital endpoints. B, digital therapeutics. C, patient recruitment. D, trial decentralization. And E, real world evidence collection and interpretation. So. I don't think there's a right answer there, but we'll see where the audience feels the trends will take us in the in the near term. So again, please contribute to the polls and and once more thanks to the panel. You can bring up the results, please. Surprise, actually, a, a clear winner, actually, in terms of the audience. So uh, almost half of you feel that the greatest applications are going to be in real world evidence generation and interpretation. So really, really terrific. An area that's that's taking off. And of course, as we heard earlier from our FDA commissioner, Rob Califf, an area that's primed for, um, for excellence and really to contribute. So terrific. Thank you very much.